This is Look West, a podcast from California's Assembly Democrats. Hi, I'm Don Andrews with Look West. With me today is producer Nancy Coleman. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Don. Water is a huge part of all of our lives. You talked with experts, lawmakers, advocates about many, many, many different water-related issues. What stuck with you after all those hours talking about water? Well done first. Water has been an issue that the state legislature works on every single legislative session. It is such a multifaceted complex issue that we will not be able to tackle it all with just one episode. So we will be doing more than one episode regarding this fascinating topic. We also learned that one of the biggest water problems is that many Californians do not have clean water at home. As you know, I come from Mexico, and even though I live in a very affluent neighborhood and was very privileged, I experienced water scarcity from time to time. And in rural areas, it is even worse. So hearing that we have this issue in California has been very shocking. Michael Claiborne, Senior Attorney at Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, and Susana Deanda, Executive Director at the Community Water Center, told me water accessibility and affordability are two reasons many Californians do not have water at home. It's really a stunning number. It's hundreds of thousands of Californians lack access to safe drinking water. Uh, The numbers go between about 300,000 up to about a million, depending on how you estimate the number of private domestic wells in the state um, and water quality and contamination impacting those wells. We don't have perfect data there, but the estimates go from hundreds of thousands to about a million. Over 1 million Californians on a daily basis cannot drink safely from the tap water without the fear of becoming sick. We know that almost 300 public water systems are not providing potable drinking water. And the vast majority of these systems that are out of compliance are serving low-income people of color communities. That's already what's happening right now. What we've seen in the past from prior droughts, we've seen communities completely lose water where Families have had to live without running water for years, where they have to truck in water from other places. It's very expensive, and more importantly, it's not the right way to address such a basic necessity for human beings. Now, there's preliminary studies that show right now that if we don't properly prioritize our drinking water for human consumption, if we don't do that now the right way, we're going to be faced with more people in the state without having any water at all, or increased concentrations of contaminated water, especially during the drought. When you have less mixture of water or blending of our groundwater sources, there is a good chance of having increased concentration of contaminants found in our drinking water. It's an unacceptable number. Uh, It's really one of the major failings, I think, in the state of California that we we have not addressed this drinking water problem that's impacting so many people. There have been steps taken in the last decade to try to get there. Um, In 2011, the state passed the human right to water, or was it 2012? Um, And since then, there have been policy changes just about every legislative session to try to get at this problem. And we're in the process of implementing them. I have a lot of optimism that we're going to make a lot of progress over the next 10 years. But to the extent the state let this problem get so widespread without addressing it 20, 30 years ago, I think it's really a failing. Uh, Drinking water contamination impacts communities throughout the state. In just about every county in the state, there are systems that fail to deliver safe drinking water. And even in counties where there are fewer community water systems or actual water systems that have contamination issues, there are likely domestic private wells that have issues. So it's really a statewide problem. There are different areas of the state that are more impacted. So the Central Coast, San Joaquin Valley, East Coachella Valley all have disproportionate impacts from groundwater quality contamination, but it really is a statewide problem. Assemblywoman Christina Garcia from Bell Gardens told me those same problems of affordability and contamination are also very easy to see in her LA area neighborhoods. We have a lot of contamination in our water supplies. It's a a lot of man-made disasters. A lot of companies who are there not doing right by their neighbors. And so we have lead, we have chromium-6, we have arsenic, we have PFAS, uh, which is an emerging 
chemical these days, uh, initial testing for PFOS, which is a forever chemical that we know is carcinogen. When you looked at LA County, the only detection that happened was in my district. Uh, and so it's a district that has constantly been treated like a wasteland uh, by lots of different folks out there. And so it makes it really hard. A lot of our water comes from the ground. It's how it becomes more affordable if we don't have to import it. But as that water table goes down, we get more and more pollution that's concentrated. So it makes it a lot harder for individuals out there. Uh, and so we have issues with the color of the water, with the taste of the water. You know, it's interesting to have dogs that, you know, have been drinking tap water, but a couple of years ago stopped drinking the water. And so I was like, well, what's in my water that my dogs suddenly are afraid to drink this water uh, out there? And so, you know, I think it's for a lot of us, we turn on the tap and think, the companies are doing what they're supposed to do to keep us safe, but that's not necessarily the reality in our backyard. For a lot of my immediate neighbors in the city of Bell Gardens, the water is not affordable. Uh, we just actually recently did an inventory of water rates in the region, and it's pretty high. And it seems to be that these smaller cities have much higher water rates than larger cities. And so whether it's economies of scales or people making poor decisions about investment, uh, we also have infrastructure that has been um, looked as, uh, neglected for decades and so fixing that has gotten much more expensive uh, and so our water rates are also higher because of that um, we uh, and so I would say people are paying their bills but they're definitely struggling and making choices between do I pay for my water bill do I pay for my medicine do I pay for my electricity uh, struggling uh, day to day you know to make ends meet well Nancy clearly the water crisis in California is a widespread problem what did you find out are the biggest obstacles to dealing with these water problems? There are so many obstacles, but Assemblywoman Christina Garcia, Susana de Anda, and Michael Claiborne told me that when it comes to solving the state's water problems, local, regional, and state water officials are all facing really serious challenges. I think the greatest challenges are, A, we have chemicals in our groundwater, that we don't, we're not even aware of. And so we're starting to learn about that now. Uh, I think a lot of times uh, we don't have water systems that are prepared and have the resources to pay for, for the cleanup. And so if I have, a, I'll give you an example. I have the city of Bell Gardens owns 1400 connections and they have a lot of contamination there. For them to clean up just PFAS alone, we're looking at about a $20 a month charge on their constituencies. Uh, and so how do, how do these constituents afford that? They can, and so instead the water system just doesn't do anything, but we continue to put people's lives at risk. We know that these forever chemicals are carcinogen, and that's on top of everything else that's already in our waters. And so we have, we have economies of scales problems, and these are contaminations that my constituents are not responsible for. They are not beneficiaries of even the profits that were made out of the products that were using these chemicals, but then we end up with the burden. And so how do you go after these companies when they have gone bankrupt, when they disappeared? Who's left with the tab, but it's constituents who are already pretty marginalized and already vulnerable? I think the state needs to be thinking about how do we help through our resources and spread out those costs across the whole state to take care of these vulnerable communities out there. I really do believe that we created this, this problem, which m brings me to think that we can fix it. Now that means that we need to make sure that we have adequate data that captures the reality of the systems without safe drinking water, that we design the solutions in a way that are appropriate for each community in each public water system and each domestic well. But I also think it's important to flag that our technology needs to be advancing at the same time of the need Look, right now, we don't have certified filtration devices to remove high levels of concentrations of certain contaminants. The reality is we need to catch up on that. And those devices and technology and filtration devices need to be affordable to ensure that we can have safe drinking water. Unfortunately, as a water advocate, I know firsthand that some contaminants, if you're not looking for them, you're not going to find them. We already know where there's certain contaminants and certain types of water quality. We need to design the, the treatment in a way that's going to be affordable, that's scalable, that's mindful of solutions that have short-term and long-term strategies. Look, solutions can't take another 10 years. That's not, we don't need that. And we managed to pass the human right to water in 2012. We need to ensure that the state of California commits to, to delivering on ensuring that every Californian can wake up every, every day to turn on their tap water without the fear of becoming sick. So there's absolutely a health impact from lack of access to safe drinking water. Uh, the most obvious health impacts are associated with drinking contaminated water. 
And those are really clear. If you have arsenic or nitrate in your water, the health impacts are documented. They include uh, higher risks of cancer. Uh, for nitrate, there's a syndrome called blue baby syndrome that impacts pregnant women and infants ability to absorb oxygen that can be fatal. So the health impacts of contaminated drinking water are expansive and really shouldn't be something that any family should have to deal with. Every action has an impact. An entity that's polluting, there's someone that's not doing their job adequately either. There's this mandate where there's regulatory agencies that have to do a better job in regulating pollution. And so it's not only just the polluter, in addition to the polluter, we have the, the, the lax regulatory process and the lack of stronger regulatory programs to limit and to penalize the polluter. So you have the polluter, you have the lack of good regulations, the lack of good enforcement that also needs to be focused. Nancy, uh, we can't talk about anything today without bringing up the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, what'd you find out about how COVID-19 is impacting the water crisis? As you know, Don, we always talk about the tale of the two Californias, the one for the rich and the one for the poor. So Michael and Susanna told me COVID-19 has made it very clear that this tale is alive. COVID-19 is a lot like what we're likely to see with climate change. It's impacted communities by exacerbating existing issues. We all faced challenges in early March and April, or at least those of us who are lucky enough to shelter in place at home faced challenges that we hadn't had to address before. Things like going to the grocery store and not being able to find food on the shelves. And um, in the case of families that do not have access to safe tap water, uh, water was the exact same issue. So they'd go to the grocery store, expect to be able to find bottled water, which unfortunately too many families rely upon as their primary source of water for drinking, for cooking, for brushing their teeth and bottled water was not available. We were getting a lot of calls from households that don't have safe drinking water that couldn't find bottled water or a safe water supply in the stores. Since then, we've been getting a lot of calls from folks that as stores have caught up and started to restock shelves, there's now water in the stores, but the economic impacts of the pandemic are severe and they're felt worse in low-income communities of color. Um, so the ability to afford to go out and buy a second water supply after you've already paid for water you can't drink has been extremely challenging. As COVID was brought into our reality, it only made it already worse. We already live in a bad condition. And so what COVID brought to the forefront was, again, this inequality of who has good water and who doesn't. And as we recover, because I think we need to be thinking about recovery efforts and making sure that those are going to be equitable for our frontline communities. Our frontline workers right now will go to work and come home to a space where they can't drink tap water. And then they have to make sure that when they go to the store, that there's water available. We work with families who would go to the store to find additional drinking water. They couldn't find it in the shelves. So if we're asked to do something, we have to be mindful that the compliance needs to be designed in a way that's fair because it's not fair to tell people to stay home and don't go anywhere, but if their water is not safe to drink at home, they have to go out and look for it. And they need to, be, they need to have the opportunity to access that safe drinking water. Because if we don't do that, then we're exposing families, frontline families, to be forced to drink tap water that's contaminated. And that is not okay. We're hoping that as people experience for the first time in early March and April, water scarcity and food scarcity for themselves, there's an increased understanding that and awareness that this isn't a sustainable solution for families that don't have safe, safe tap water, that this is something that needs to be fixed urgently. And then there's impacts related to just inability to maintain basic sanitation that were high, highlighted by COVID-19. Um, washing your hands, water for wastewater, access to be able to flush toilets, really basic things that most Californians take for granted and impact communities of color disproportionately. This year, because of COVID, COVID we had to pivot and strategize to ensure that people would not 
have their water turned off if they couldn't afford to pay a water bill. And so we work with leadership and our governor stepped up to the challenge and he executed a moratorium to ensure that if you can't pay your water bill, they can't shut it down. But more importantly now, what we need to focus on moving forward is to ensure that the recovery costs are gonna be equitable. We understand that we need to ensure that these systems that are not gonna be billing people are not gonna go defunct either. But you know what, really importantly, what we really need to do in the state of California, we needed to continue to advocate for a statewide water affordability low income rate assistance program to ensure that all Californians can have access to assistance if they need to pay their water bills. Look, we have very similar programs and utilities for gas and even cell phones. We definitely need this in California for water. On top of everything we have heard, another big problem we're facing is climate change. When I talked to Michael and Susana, they both agreed that this is, has been a man-made problem. And we should talk about it as climate justice, not climate change. I also had the opportunity to speak to Assemblywoman Tasha Borner Horvath about climate change, particularly sea level rise. Sea level rise is what happens when our polar ice caps melt, right? As we have climate change and you have global warming, the polar ice caps and other land covered by ice start melting. That increases the amount of water in the sea, but also it means the water will be warmer. And if we go back to high school chemistry, we'll remember that warmer water takes up more space than colder water. And so what we're gonna see is, you know, it's, a, it's probably a, an issue that's 50 or 100 years out, so it's probably not you and I who are gonna see the um, dramatic impacts of sea level rise, but it's our children. And so it's very important in our district that we are really making sure that we have, we're doing what we can now to help minimize that impact in the future for the kids. So you look at the impact to our coast, and if you look at just the coastal erosion, you're, you have about a $150 billion impact to major infrastructure. In my district, for example, it is our railroad tracks. Just south of my district in Del Mar, we have bluffs collapsing where the railroad is, and we always say, like, Del Mar is about to fall into the ocean, and that is the second busiest rail corridor from San Diego to San Luis Obispo, second busiest rail corridor in the entire country. So when goods movement stops, not only people movement, but goods movement stop, you're going to see a dramatic impact to the economy of California and the nation because so much comes in through the port of San Diego. In the Bay Area, where we're looking at Coast Highway 101 on the east side of the peninsula, you look at the maps of sea level rise and what that means for flooding, it means we're going to have to move that road and I don't know where we move it to and these are the these are the type of really difficult questions that are very very expensive that I think we have to grapple with up and down the coast. Um, on top of that in my second sea level rise hearing in Foster City Professor Christina Hill um, she presented something called groundwater intrusion and I think we should have all known this from again high school chemistry um, but it's the principle of equilibrium as sea levels rise groundwater will rise to meet it. And I think that's something that is new. And what we're seeing with climate change and sea level rise is our understanding of the science of it is evolving. And so one of the big things is, we're, you know, in Foster City, for example, they did a $90 million bond to raise their levy around the city. They're built on wetlands. But if sea levels rise and groundwaters rise inside, they're going to get ponding and, and pooling of water that's coming up from the ground. And that probably doubles the impact of uh, sea level rise to the California economy from $150 billion, and our best guess is around $300 billion. And I think one of the things that we forget when we, when we think about groundwaters rising is we forget that we have toxic sites that have been capped and they're currently safe. But as groundwater rises, that could really mean that that toxicity gets released into our groundwater because of the rising um, groundwater levels. And so I think we're going to see more and more impacts that we're just now beginning to understand um, with the impact of climate change. The impacts of climate change don't end there. Christina and Tasha, the two assembly members we have been talking to, pointed out drought level conditions are another water problem climate change is making worse. We see increased heat events, we see wildfires, we see increased drought. San Diego is actually very resilient. They've bought, you know they've built and invested in a lot of um, a lot of storage 
We have the desalinization plant, which was very controversial, but does add to our water resiliency. But when we have increased drought, then we have water rationing. And how do people um, adapt to that? Climate change is going to affect my community first and foremost that way. I think in the same respect, climate change is going to make it till we have these longer drought periods. We're seeing it in places like Australia already that oftentimes mimics what happens in California, but just a little bit ahead of the curve in bad ways. And so as we have these droughts, we have to pump more water out of the ground, uh, which the more we pump out, the more we're getting these same contaminants now in our water system and we're not, we don't have the filtration systems to clean it up or we're importing water that's three to four times more expensive and we have constituencies that as it is can't afford the situation. Uh, and so I think we have some real issues also with basic things like water for my community. And so whether it's the air or the water that's making us sick, for me, climate change is only gonna make us sicker quicker. So we need to be, all of us need to be changing behaviors and finding ways to conserve water even beyond what we've already learned in the last few years. Uh, and we need to be prepared for for a lot more drought in a state like this. And so I think we need to stop thinking about convenience first. And I think instead we need to be thinking about long-term sustainability, uh, you know, and, and changing our behaviors in small and big ways. So it's not just with our water, but when we think about plastic and, and, and how and how we transport the water, or how we carry it, or the container that we have, that's also part of the system that we need to be thinking about in this. And so I think we've put convenience for a really long time at the forefront of how consumers think. And we as consumers need to start changing that because that's also gonna make companies change the way they cater to us. People are becoming more conscientious about how they use water, but we're gonna have to do more about water resiliency. And obviously, there's going to be the impacts of coastal erosion and the impacts to our low-lying infrastructure, right? So whether it's our UV um, water cleaning plant that's right there at Moonlight Beach, um, whether that is what's going to be the impact to San Onofre State, um, so the nuclear waste stored at Songs, um, with gr groundwater intrusion going up, which hasn't been studied yet, there are all these different impacts. And so I think we're looking at it, we're seeing the impacts now, and they're just going to get worse. And I'm sure there are impacts that we don't even know are coming. Nancy, so there's lots and lots of water problems here. Uh, you've gotten a chance to touch on many of them. What about solutions? Anybody have any ideas for us? Water issues do not have a one-size-fits-all solution. It is such an extraordinarily complex and layered process with many moving parts. So Michael, Susanna, and the assembly members had some thoughts on what some solutions might be. The first is drinking water solutions for communities that either don't have access to safe drinking water as a community today or are served by a system that's not sustainable um, and are likely to see drinking water impacts in the near future. Um, so that's one piece is actually fixing drinking water problems impacting communities. A second is drinking water source protection. So most communities I work with rely on groundwater as their sole or primary source of drinking water, either because they're reliant on domestic wells or small water systems. And protecting the quality of that water is always going to be the best way to ensure that a community has access to safe drinking water. It's really difficult to treat water after it's already contaminated. So taking steps to ensure water quality is protected. And then as a third bucket, household level affordability and access. We need to do a lot more in the state to ensure that households served by water systems, even if the water is safe, are able to afford that water and aren't impacted by disconnections. And I think one of the policy changes that I'm hoping there's more capacity for in this state is moving away from water shutoffs, water disconnections as a means of collection of water bills. What we've seen in the state is that, again, thousands of people a year lose access to safe water because their water is shut off because they can't pay their bill. And that to me is completely inconsistent with the human rights water that we've established in California. So we're hoping to see increased protections around water shutoffs. It really shouldn't be a collection tool for families that are unable to pay or unable to afford water. I think the big step that needs to be taken there is uh, 
implementation of the AB 401 report from a couple of years ago by establishing low income rate assistance, like we see on the energy side with the CARE program. With SB 200, it was money to advance the human right to water. Now we have funding available to ensure that we deliver on that promise. SB 200 is promising to have solu money for solutions for short term and long term. And that's the right way. That's, we're moving in the right direction. However, I feel like we need to ensure that we're also responding to the urgency. This is a public health threat for Californians. I do think the state has gotten to a point where we need to take action now because we have millions of people whose health is at risk, whose livelihood is at risk. Uh, I think the state is trying to figure out how to turn it around. We have passed, we've asked voters to pass um, different water measures to, to try to do infrastructure. We are trying to put more money into helping smaller communities have um, access to resources for the planning and to go after these competitive grants. Uh, we have been trying to figure out how we do testing earlier, uh, how we do information to the constituents earlier, but we haven't figured out yet how do we help pay for the cleanup and spread out those costs because you can't have these communities who are not responsible for this, who didn't profit from this, but at the end of the day, they're the ones stuck with the short second having to pay for the infrastructure upgrades through their rates. And so how as a state do we help pay for that? Uh, and so I think we haven't figured that out yet. That's part of the discussion that I'm trying to push now through the different issues when we're talking water is we've left communities behind. The state has filled them at different levels through the agencies. We, we have a responsibility now to help fill up that hole and help figure out how to spread out those costs across the whole state for these vulnerable communities. Communities need to realize is in our desire to hold these companies accountable, we have a legal process that could take decades. And if we wait for that process every time, that means you're leaving communities behind for decades while we figure that out and we'll go through the legal process. And so I think we need to get comfortable with saying, you know what, we're going to find a way to pay for this cleanup now. And it might not be the fairest way, but let's clean it up now so we don't have generation after generation that's waiting and continuing to be sick. And at the same time, we have a second parallel track where we're going after those bad actors. And if we get the money, great, we could put it towards reducing rates for everyone. Uh, but this idea of like, I need to have perfection or I need to, you know, go after them first before I spend money, I think is a really irresponsible pattern and model, which has been our current model, you know, in our state. Uh, and it's not picking one over the, over the other. It's like, how do we do both? How do we multitask? Uh, we, we cannot afford to continue to leave communities behind. We have too much information now. And I, and I think having this information and choosing to wait is when this starts to become criminal by people in power. So what I think is really important that we do as legislators is do our best to understand what's happening and do our best to plan for the best use of taxpayer money to mitigate some of these problems. We're not going to be able to mitigate it, all of it, but we can look at the infrastructure and say, let's be thoughtful and have a hundred year vision versus putting band-aids on stuff now that we're going to have to tear out in, in maybe 20 years because it's unsustainable. Everything we do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions now will lessen the impact of climate change in the future and push out the point at which we have these very, very expensive and difficult decisions to make. And so I think aggressively reducing greenhouse gas emissions and helping people um, move to electric vehicles, helping people choose to uh, bike, uh, maybe that's an e-bike in my district, I have a lot of hills, um, maybe that's transit. It's what we can do to really, you know, it's renewable energy. Whatever we can do to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions now is probably the biggest thing we can do to fight climate change long term. So that's some of the things what our officials and lawmakers will be working on. Uh, with the idea in mind that no person is too small to make change happen, I asked Michael and Susana if they had some ideas about things we can do ourselves. A few things that have helped, especially over the last year, um, in early March and April, private donations of bottled water went a long way to addressing some of the short-term needs in that crisis. So there's always a need for getting engaged that way. Um, the need exceeds the amount of funding that's available for interim water supplies like bottled water. I think as a broader point though, getting engaged in state poli politics and the ability to push policy changes at the state level that can get past some of the local barriers that have prevented solutions from being implemented is really important. Um, pushing policy change like 
uh, low income rate assistance over the next year or two is going to be really important. And those are going to take grassroots movements and a lot of support. If you drink water, you're a potential ally to ensure that everyone can safely drink water from the tap without the fear of becoming sick. I want to live in a world where, or in a California where mothers don't have to worry if their child swallows the water they used to brush their teeth because they can get sick. I want to live in a California where parents don't have to worry if their kids at school don't have safe drinking water. Now, I know right now we're doing distance learning, but there's going to be a time where we go back to that institution and our schools and our homes, our most safest places, need to provide safe drinking water. So the call to action for all of us is to ensure, one, to figure out what's in your drinking water. Ensure that you have safe drinking water. And if you do, you need to be in alignment and support those of us that don't have that reality. And then secondary usage of water is important to also recognize that it's part of the equation. But I really do believe that we need to shift this mindset to understand that as a human being, you need to have safe drinking water right now and for the future. So whatever actions we do now, we cannot make the, we can't continue to condemn the future or next generations to live in this reality. We just can't do that anymore. And we need to advocate to stop pollution. We need to stop polluting our drinking water. And I think all of our regulatory agencies need to be more proactively in making sure that all of their programs limit and stop contamination of our drinking water sources. We have no time to waste. If we want change, we must be the change. It takes all of us being involved in the solutions for something great to happen. I want to thank all of the people that so kindly allow us to interview them for this episode. There is still so much more to learn, and we will get to visit this issue again on another episode of Luke West. Well, and thanks to you as well, Nancy. We'll look forward to those additional episodes. I'm Don Andrews. Thanks for listening to Look West. The Look West podcast is produced by the California Assembly Democrats. When you think of California and politics, remember to look west.